Hello, my name is Jack Henneman, and I'm one of the uh, visiting instructors for uh, the course here in uh, management te techno technology management. I'm very happy to be here. I started my career as a corporate lawyer and spent most of it in medical technology and biotechnology. And in the last few years, I have a consulting practice advising new uh, entrepreneurs in medical technology and biotechnology. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Bruce Graham. Uh, I'm a Princeton engineer, Stanford MBA. Uh, in the 1980s, I, I built chips at Intel in Silicon Valley. I've been out in Silicon Valley now 40 years. Uh, since 91 Business School, um, Stanford, I, I've been backing startups, mostly as a venture capitalist. Um, in the last few years, I've shifted more to a co-founder mentor model, but I've been involved uh, deeply with 50 or so different startups um, with some luck. Uh, so far, 22 positive liquidities. Um, I'm currently working with four startups. Um, they've had different strategies for coping, getting through COVID, trying to figure out their way through, um, both in terms of teams and locations, um, and how, the, how do they engage with customers, right? When in a, in a world where you don't have customer visits, how do you get design wins? How do you build a product that gets designed into a electric vehicle, um, into a autonomous vehicle? I, I think the world has changed, so I'll just kind of migrate in, into the topic, um, where customer expectations used to be that you would have to show up on site and uh, demonstrate things to people. I think now in the world of uh, Zoom and um, uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, people are accepting of interactions that they would not have accepted 15 months ago. Um, they, they will design in new technologies and new products based on engagements. Um, this, this is almost like Match.com. It's remote dating between startups and, and their final customers. Um, it's really an interesting change, an expectation that only could have been forced, I believe, through, um, through a, a COVID-type uh, environment. So it's been fun to watch so, the transition. Uh, Fun to watch and painful all at the same time. Right. Yeah. So, do you think, um, not to put questions to you, but the um, idea would be that in a surprising way, perhaps, um, the pandemic has um, opened up possibilities for startups that simply would not have occurred before, perhaps in the area of raising capital, perhaps in the area of finding customers, perhaps in the area of recruiting people who will ultimately work remotely uh, during most of that time? I think, yeah, I think all of the above. Um, capital sources, you know, I tend to invest and get involved in uh, core technology, hard technology projects. And so those projects tend to be global customer base, and there tends to be several winners, not 100 local companies. Right? So um, investors and customers from other continents will get in contact. And before, it would be expected that we'd visit you know, the BMW factory in Munich multiple times before BMW would invest. And instead, that is not how it's gone. It's been a, um, uh, a situation where one of my startups, we just raised money from BMW, Ford, a tier one supplier named Lear, a whole set of uh, 3M, a whole set of kind of global companies. And those interactions have been dominated by remote interactions that have been viewed as effective enough. And I believe three years ago, those remote interactions would have been viewed as not enough. You didn't come and, and shake our hands and, and meet us at our headquarters would have been the requirement uh, just a couple of years back. And since perhaps remote interactions are easier to schedule, and I've, I've certainly had this experience, um, one of the strange effects is in certain um, types of business, um, it, because of the ease of scheduling, um, actual cycle speed is increasing. It's easier to get to a decision because you didn't wait six weeks to plan the trip to Munich, for example. Um, and um, you're getting much greater sort of mental flexibility on the part of at least some organizations you know, that carries over into decision making. Have you seen any of that in your companies that you're advising? Well, I think the projects I work with, we're always trying to parallelize things so that um, you're doing multiple things to achieve one objective. You're trying to bring four or five factors together in June. Um, so the remote meetings 
you know, does help the uh, interactions with external parties. That said, you know, corporate um, corporates have their own tempo, and, yes. and, and you know, 3M was going to work at 3M tempo, and um, Tesla is going to work at Tesla tempo, and those two tempos are they're very different, right? So a Tesla tempo, you can make uh, decisions every week or ten days, and a 3M tempo might be a couple of months, and they're both really great organizations with different DNA and different expectations of how this work, right? So I, I think it's a, it's a re-syncing up of the tempo of the startup, the heartbeat of the startup, uh, the heartbeat of your fastest customer, and the, the heartbeat of your, your slowest but still very important customer and partner. And by the way, 3M is not the slowest at all. They, they, uh, they move quite quickly in the scheme of things. So I don't know what you see, right? So, um, so one of the, I think, interesting questions is the, um, so in, in my field, uh, biotech, biotechnology, um, you know, drug development took famously long, and there's all sorts of good reasons for it to take famously long. Um, one of the famous reasons why drug development takes a long time is you cannot ship a buggy product, to use a, uh, uh, perhaps a, a expression from the tech world. So minimum viable it, product doesn't work there's in no a vaccine. Minimum, there's no minimum viable product. Um, but we learned in the pandemic uh, an important lesson that um, delay in development of life-saving products costs lives, just as too rapid development runs the risk of, of an unsafe product. And there may be uh, a rebalancing in um, how we look at the speed of product development and more to the point, the speed of the testing of those products in various settings. So is it a, an operation warp speed bureaucracy compression well, we've that learned, you're thinking about? Or? We've, we've learned that um, you know, various, uh, if the stakes are high enough, that a lot of things actually can happen yeah. safely and competently at a much higher speed uh, and of course, I'm referring to the pacing of the development of the vaccines to address COVID-19. Um, you know, Moderna had its vaccine developed in the sense of made four days after the People's Republic of China released the gene sequencing for the vac uh, for the for the virus, and um, you know, it still took uh, from that time. 10 months for that vaccine to become permitted to be sold in the United States, uh, and about 11, I guess, for it to be authorized in Europe. That's astonishingly fast, but we actually had it in February. And um, February last year. February last year. Yeah. And the, the pace of those trials revealed in, as recently as July that the vaccine was very safe. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it might have been done had we been willing to take the political and social risk. It might have been that the vaccines could have been available as early as the summer. Um, we made a different political choice, but that was a topic of public discussion. I think it's opened up the eyes of a lot of people. There may be opportunities here in speed to build, and, and this is a topic we discussed before, to build the resilience of you know, um, the human race, to build the resilience of our supply chains, to build the resilience of um, you know, our, our, our uh, infrastructure um, that may be a theme for investing in the, in the, next, uh, in the next decade. Um, and, um, you know, I've seen that certainly in discussions around the board table. I'm a, a director at a number of uh, public, uh, publicly held medical companies in the United States, and finding ways to um, make them, you know, more resilient is going to be, I think, uh, very important. As we've seen just in the last week with the the hacking episode in the United States that shut the down, pipeline, the shut down the pipeline yeah. and feeding the East Coast. Anyway, um, maybe we should chat a little bit about investing themes that we are not certain will come true, but quite possibly might come true in what, the area of building resilience. I, I, I think we it can, and I think uh, your comments about regulation spark some an idea with me. I think 
understanding regulatory risk in the medical field is uh, an important one. Trading off one type of opportunity versus another type of risk uh, is an important trade-off. I think in the world of autonomy and autonomous vehicles, regulation plays an important what role as well. And I think in the U.S. at least, different states have had different exceptions made so that Waymo, Google's autonomous project, can drive cars and taxis in certain places that Lyft or Uber can run services, so on and so forth. And I think every time there's a crash, and there never will be zero crashes, right? This is the world we live in is not a risk-free world. Humans crash all the time. Right. And that's compared to what is a question that needs to be asked in any of these environments. I think that regulatory environment will be in critically important to how quickly autonomy and things that drive without us holding the steering wheel will get adopted, whether that vehicle is delivering your groceries um, or uh, an Amazon truck delivering your, your stuff, or whether it's uh, the 80-year-old grandpa uh, grandma trying to get downtown at a point where she shouldn't be, he or she should no longer be holding the steering wheel. Um, regulators are going to play a critical role in whether that happens in four years or 14 years. Um, and I, I've got a startup in that space that provides a, a kind of a next generation system to people like Waymo and Cruz and some of the other players. And uh, we're all keeping an eye on the, the crashes, uh, the regulations, um, the, the um, Elon's famous overpromising of his system, which is uh, really a driver assist capability. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one that you shouldn't be uh, sitting in the back seat watching TV uh, while you're while your car is driving or doing something else fun. Yeah. Um, uh, instead, um, it's really just a way to m make sure that if you doze a little bit, it'll get you back in, in the lane, right? So I think kind of regulation and uh, will determine whether that happens quickly, right? In terms of next generation stuff, I think we touched on yep. electrification. Uh, and electrification of vehicles is a, a really important theme. And I think there have been a bunch of uh, expectations set, um, almost promises made about how quickly that's going to happen and I think there are a lot of bottlenecks that um, we're going to need to think about. I think even Toyota came out and said, if we try to electrify that quickly, the grid can't deliver that electricity. There's, there's, there's the next generation of bottleneck once you, you know, electric vehicles go from 1%, 2% of cars to 20%. Lots of things break we'll up, need, we'll upstream. Need a, lot of electric, a, lot of, a lot of electricity. Yep, and a different way to distribute it than we have today. So I think there's both a lot of opportunity and... Um, there are a few blind spots, I think, in our, in our thinking as well. So, uh, so, so, you know, with resilience as a theme, we've had, because of the pandemic, huge interruptions in supply chains. We've had, obviously, huge disruption of health care, um, as we've had local surges of patients all over the world. Um, we have seen that parts of the system are very fragile in the name of economic efficiency, the world decided to concentrate drug manufacturing in a couple of countries in Asia, and that's um, being reconsidered by uh, governments and businesses all over, all over the world. We have a current shortage in um, semiconductors with you know, chips, uh, which are famously disrupting industries right now. As an ex-chip guy in the 80s, you're seeing um, the concern over the tension in Asia, China caused tension with T TSMC, the Taiwan global giant in making chips, being offered the opportunity maybe to get $35 billion of American government money and build new chip manufacturing in the US. And that's how I started my career, making chips yeah. in Silicon Valley. So it's interesting to see that kind of come back into um, the, the discussion at least, right? So with if, resilience in mind. Right? So if we were to offer advice to um, uh, shall we say, younger people uh, looking which is, to... Which is more and more of the world these days. more and more of the world, <laughs> but looking to start businesses. Um, you know, my advice would be, well, first of all, I think for the remaining life of anyone who's even 20 years old, I think biotechnology will be a huge field. So uh, if, I, I, if somebody were able to educate themselves in biochemistry, uh, medicine and so forth. That's a that's going to be a, a, a huge opportunity, especially obviously in in gene therapy and and, and gene editing, um, but also as we've learned, infectious diseases and so forth. But broader, uh, more broadly speaking, I think just the episode of the last week, cybersecurity and and well, yeah, we talked about how the world's moving to more distributed systems and security 
in a world of distributed systems is a much more complex problem. And if you can take down a pipeline, a major pipeline with a, a simple hack, and I've looked at, I've looked at several startups in the in the space, and it's really easy to get in and just take over this condenser at some power distribution station, right? And it only takes the will of a determined nation state to actually implement something like that. Yeah, right? or so even, even apparently a group just that to, to, to... Just to mess with the world. To, to generate some blackmail money. Yep, but, I think so. So, so cybersecurity is another example. Um, um, supply chain resilience in many different forms, which obviously includes the cybersecurity element, but it also includes technologies that would um, allow for the wider distribution, the decentralized production of, of products, the wider distribution of them. We've seen things like them. 3D printing and others which are viewed as a way of distributing the ability to make stuff right. to people right. throughout the world, not just plastic models, but eventually functional things that have chips and other things embedded in that, that you can build with uh, additive manufacturing. So those are huge, yeah. huge problems to solve. And then, and then it, uh, obviously the climate field is going to attract a staggering amount of money. Um, um, it has all over the world that will continue to do, especially with the change of administration in the United States, there's going to be an enormous Well, look, one of my startups is talking to the DOE loan program, which is turned back on again, uh, the DOE loan the program. DOE which is the Department of Energy. In the the U.S. United Department States. of Energy, right? And they look at my company that is very focused on electrification that has design wins at major car makers, um, and they're ready to loan money to build you know, factories in different places in the U.S. because it's U.S. Department of Energy money, uh, and that uh, ability to scale um, is something that's going to be supported I think so much effort and focus has gone into solar and wind as maybe the only answers, and it, it's unclear to me how far solar and wind can take us. They can take us to here, but maybe not to the finish line. It may be. It may be that out there are of nowhere, other sources. It may be that next generation nuclear power turns out to be just the thing that solves yep. the problem of the need for massively more electricity on demand. Well, on demand, yep. while at the same time having to. Um, um, having to uh, build a more resilient and sustainable lower yeah. carbon environment. So, I think, I think there are a bunch of alternative. I, I love energies uh, sources which are not well understood today, which are not just simply trying to do solar and PV cheaper, yeah. but to try to uh, do some other smart things as well. One, my boy's uh, 19, uh, you know, finished up his freshman year at Brown, and he's interning at one of my companies that has figured out a way to make a combined film which emits to the dark sky the way the Persians made ice 2,000 years ago while reflecting the sun. So it's a 24-7 it's a cooling technology which is cheaper to implement than solar, which provides three times as much energy per unit area per unit cost, right? So something that's not talked about much, but you know, we're on Walmart's you know, roof and Target's roof, and this is a, a technology which could scale in it. And I view this as the, as the slice problem. You can't solve this problem with one yeah. silver, you know, one piece of the puzzle. You need several different pieces of the puzzle to so the climate, change how we, you know, make and consume energy. Yeah, the climate problem will involve, if not a hundred solutions, then a thousand solutions. And um, simple answers are um, not going to solve it. And uh, each one of the components of it, if I understand your view, each one of the components of it is so complex, there will be an enormous amount of room for entrepreneurs to solve a, a segment of it. I think so. Uh, we talked about some of the grid bottlenecks with respect to electrification. There are a series of problems that will need to be solved there. Yeah. And then, of course, that's also in a regulated environment because the grid, grid is highly regulated, at least in the U.S., right? I'm sure it, most places. It's, it's core you know, infrastructure. Yeah. So trying to figure out how to get innovation into a world where innovation has been slow, where yes. innovation is viewed as risk. Yeah. It's like trying to get a new computer into a NASA rocket. Yeah. New is not But it's easier to get it popular. into a SpaceX rocket than a NASA well, rocket. Well, that we need we need SpaceX Elon type of entrepreneurship in a sector that has been moving very very right. slowly so right. far. And and I think when you say Elon type entrepreneurship what you mean is solving big problems, you know, um, at tempo. At uh, yeah, uh, solving big problems at tempo. Uh, just say how 
uh, excited we are to be here participating in this program. I did it once before in the fall of 2019. This is Bruce's first time, but it's a tremendously interesting program. Uh, it engages the students. I've heard uh, this, the, the quality of the students is terrific. The quality of the students is terrific, and I think that um, it's a wonderful thing that it's happening here in an environment where there are so many highly educated uh, young people coming up who are so excited about the opportunity to start businesses. Many of them want to do so you know, for Ukraine, and I think as we've talked about it, you know, it will become easier for them to attract people and capital from elsewhere in Europe and, and even the United States in the post-COVID environment. I think, I think yeah, one of my startups has worked with a Lviv-based software kind of outsourcing shop and had, has had a real positive experience with the engagement, talent, uh, kind of work ethic, right? And I think, you know, the word gets out. Yeah. Um, uh, not just, uh, you know, I mean, across the globe at yeah. some point in time, this is a place you want to do business. Yeah. So we're excited yeah. about that. We're very excited about that. Yeah. This is my first time here, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can ask me in for three days. <laughs> I, I, well, I think that, um, so when we did this the last time, uh, we had the, the students prepared um, um, business startup pitches over the course of the semester, and then um, several months after we were here, they presented their pitches to us. And, and that told me that the... Um, um, improvement in understanding over just a few months between when we met with them at the beginning of the course, this is the last time, and the work that they presented at, uh, after having spent several months in the course, you know, they became much more sophisticated and experienced and able to describe the opportunities for their startups, some of which were real startups, some of which were um, invented for the purpose of the course, uh, but in all cases, the improvement in the quality of their work uh, was tremendous over a short period of time. So I think that the, uh, that is the best evidence I have seen that this is a great opportunity for uh, students that can uh, take advantage of it. I think we got pulled in because we have a classmate, Sev, um, Princeton classmate, and Sev's um, engagement is, a, is, in my view, a real positive, I think. Yeah. Uh, what I've seen from from Seven projects that he works on, that you know we've got smart people here. We've got people who are ready to engage, who are eager to learn, who are proud of where they come from, and want to want to shine in the world. And uh, that's ninety percent of success that's right great. there. That's great. 